just before I start, my background is actually after I did my PhD. I was working in IT for several years before going to a more sort of an academic position. So I have you know, some experience from in IT, information technology. So I'm going to be talking today more from the analyst point of view as an analyst um, trying to answer sort of uh, database, and trying to answer data questions. So I'm not sure if anybody here is associated, I mean, with a hospital in New York State. Um, but if you're associated with a hospital in New York State, there's probably one thing you've been focused on in the last you know, year is this project called DISRIP. Um, and this is a, um, a big project. Um, so in New York State, there's a program, um, every state, there's a pro Medicaid program. This is insurance for uh, low income uh, residents. It's in New York State, it's a pretty large program. There's about five, I think right now it's five, a little bit over five million people. Out of 20 million are on Medicaid in New York State. So it's a quarter, a little less than a quarter of the population uh, are, are in me are Medicaid. Uh, so this population is traditionally the very difficult population to manage. Um, and New York State has the highest, I think they, oh, they still do, but the highest per capita spend in Medicaid in the United States. Uh, and so there's been a, so when Andrew Cuomo became governor, it was a push to sort of make Medicaid more efficient. And one of the things they started negotiating with CMS, which sort of manages the Medicaid program, was this waiver program, um, which would allow to bring money back into New York State. So if New York State can save money in Medicaid, um, now it's a, it's a 50, I think the last numbers I saw was like a $50 billion program in New York State. You know, part state pays part, counties pay part, the federal government pays part of it. But if they can save money uh, by reducing, you know, improving healthcare outcomes, they will be providing money back into the system to improve healthcare, to reform healthcare. So also if you're in the healthcare field, you hear a lot of talks about the move from what's called the fee-for-service model to a value-based payment model. Um, so what that basically is in the past, and it's still, let's say, a large proportion of the way things get paid in healthcare is, you know, you see a doctor, doctor provides a service, they bill a specific code, they get money for that code, right? Um, and it's a very sort of disjunctive, disjunct system. Um, the idea in value-based payment is that you're going to uh, focus on the quality of the uh, outcomes. So in the past, if you um, got a, for example, a hip replacement, you know, the surgeon made money, the hospital made money, and if you came back sick, or like there was a problem with the implant, the hospital would make more money, the surgeon would make more money, right? So it, um, you know, the, there wasn't really an incentive to sort of improve the quality of care. Um, and so with value-based payment, it's going to be you get a flat amount for a hip replacement. And if you have problems with the hip replacement, uh, the hospital system has to eat the cost. So that gives an incentive to sort of improve uh, quality and start using data to understand the process. The other aspect in DISRIP that's an important aspect is integrating care across multiple settings from the inpatient to the outpatient. Um, when you go to the hospital, um, you know, they discharge you, you're in a acute care hospital, you're there for a period of time, it's very intensive care, you have nurses, you have, you know, uh, and then they discharge you from the hospital and, you know, it's kind of like you're on your own. Um, and so the other, op the other part of DISRIP is for, you know, the Medicaid members that are in the hospital and discharged, we want to sort of continue their care out of the hospital and improve that, and so we have sort of a better care transition. Um, so, um, Another part of DISRIP is the, the first sort of Medicaid, changes in Medicaid were done at the state level, and now they're going to be basically in, in DISRIP, you push the changes to the local system level. So Mount Sinai um, is a participating provider um, all across the state. I think there's about 20 different uh, sort of networks that are sort of responsible and take risk on uh, people. So it's a... Um, you know, so it's, it's a very complicated prog uh, program, a lot of deadlines, um, but potentially, this is probably going to be the largest cat, like infusion of money into the New York State uh, healthcare, you know, hospitals 
for a period of time. I mean, it's, you know, we're talking, you know, not millions, we're talking billions, right? So if we meet the metrics, you could, uh, potentially about the $8 billion could come back to New York State and the New York State hospitals. So I am from Stony Brook University. Um, Stony Brook um, is in Suffolk County, Long Island, and we have sort of branded ourselves the Suffolk Care Collaborative. And basically we're responsible for the care of Medicaid members in Suffolk County, uh, New York. And eventually we'll be taking sort of risk uh, on them. So we want to be able to sort of understand the data, work with the data. So we're at Stony Brook University. Uh, we're an academic medical center. Um, we're, you know, we're also a part of the state government. Um, we're a state organization. And you know, I've been sort of in doing data analytics at Stony Brook since about 2006, 2007. Um, so I've, you know, it's like I had a lot of experience sort of working through programs. We had a contract with the New York State Department of Health for data analysis. And we've had, you know, been doing this for, you know, five, six uh, years. During that time, I've got a lot of experience sort of, you know, what works, doesn't work. So, you know, we have, for example, in New York, Stony Brook, New York State, or through SUNY, we have licenses for a lot of the commercial software products. Uh, we could, you know, because uh, there's been negotiated some kind of contract, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, ArcGIS, we have a campus license for, we have a campus license for SAS. So we, you know, we can get a lot of software at uh, no or little cost, you know, commercial software. Uh, but then, this was particularly for us in this one, because we were sort of in a role of not just being like an academic institution, but now we're actually going out and acting as a, as a healthcare provider. Um, can we use these licenses that we have an academic license for something? Can we use it in something where we're going to be you know, potentially taking risk on people, it's, it gets a little bit complicated. So that kind of worried me a little bit that our traditional approach of using some of the proprietary software tools would lead to some future problems. Um, and also, um, we are a state organization, so we have this purchase order system, which t it's real pain. It's, uh, you have to order licenses, uh, you put a purchase order in, it takes really forever. And you put a purchase order in, and you know, it, the system goes down in the summer, you can't order anything during the summer, it's a real, you know, so we had really a tight timeline, that was one issue. And you know, I have experience using some of this commercial software on the on, on top line, and it's always been very complicated to install. You know, you spend a lot of time, you know, uh, working on configuration, you have to get the li correct license files. You have to worry about activating the licenses. And a lot of times we're on restricted networks, so we have issues with license activations. You might have a licensed server on the other side of the campus, and we're working with on the different side of the campus, the medical side, and there's a firewall between them, so we can't talk to the licensed server. So it, it's a very sort of complicated process. It's, it just adds, it just makes the process more difficult. Um, and keeping track of licenses can be a real pain. You almost really basically need almost one, if you're for a big project, you almost need one person, one full FDE, just basically uh, doing the administration for the, the ordering, the licenses, because it just takes a long time negotiating with you know, vendors. Um, you know, uh, so, uh, and so in this project, the state had given us a very like, strict deadline to meet. Uh, you know, we start the, CMS approved, uh, the, in the first slide, they approved the uh, proposal in, uh, they got the approval in May of 2004, or April of 2014. We had to be up and running by May, and sort of our first deliverable was basically in uh, September of, uh, and we had to have most of our analysis done by September, and so we had a very tight timeline. So we, for, I felt that, uh, you know, we could have went with the traditional solutions, but I thought, wait, let's try out, we're not gonna be working with that large of a volume of data, let's try this approach, and then if, if it doesn't work, we can always move to sort of proprietary solution. Um, so, um, if anybody here is from Health IT, they know about, 
it's sort of always a couple steps backwards, right? Um, when you, if you have insurance and you get a uh, claim, like uh, you get that bill, explanation of benefits, EOB, right? The, most likely your bill was processed by a mainframe system and, you know, uh, running COBOL. And, you know, it's, uh, that's still running today. So the systems for New York State, the Medicaid payment system is called eMedney. It's written in COBOL, it's maintained by CSC. Um, it's a gigantic system, it's complicated. It runs on a mainframe. Um, SAS is also another very popular sort of analytic tool in healthcare. Um, it's expensive if you have to buy sort of the licenses for it. And also other aspects, why is healthcare IT so sort of, sometimes I would say sort of a little bit backwards. There's issues like, you know, legal liability, right? So you're taking care of patients. If something goes wrong, right? Do you want to have uh, people worry about legal liability? You know, then there's this idea, this rule called HIPAA, which has good intentions, and what it's you know does is you know protect one of the aspects of it's protecting data privacy, but it's used a lot of times to sort of shut down certain solutions because it doesn't meet the HIPAA criteria. Um, and if you, I think, if you have uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield hospital insurance, you just um, you just probably found out that I think Anthem, they, they got uh, 70 million people were um, their rec I mean, so even though we have, the <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, so it, you know, the, and the li liability cost is high. So, I, so, and I think in the population health, because it's outside of the direct care of patients, um, you know, can be a context for proving ground for open source solutions. So, Last year, I went to this. I mean, I went to this conference because I had done some. You know, I had to, I had these concerns about some of the proprietary software. Um, you know, as a, as we were, as our team was getting ready to do the um, analytics, so I came to the Postgres PostgreSQL uh, PG Comp last year, and you know what I found there was that this is you know it's a. Um, mature database platform. I also like that there was a lot of, seems like a lot of active development. It wasn't a project that, you know, where, you, were, you know, there was no, you know, it was quiet. It seemed a very active project, right? And um, it was easy to install on, comics, on common Linux distributions, even on a um, Windows server, you could install it. And if you know in health IT, a lot of, there's still a, a big dependence on Microsoft Windows in a lot of the health IT shops. Um, uh, and the one thing, uh, one of the talks I went to last year was from a company, I think it's called Spatial IQ, and they were showing how they were doing things with uh, PostGIS, and it, I was pretty impressed with what I saw. So, and I'll go into a little bit more detail why the spatial aspect's important in doing healthcare analytics. Um, also, you know, good support for some of the, the, the more recent ANSI standards for SQL. Uh, so giving you flexibility to write pretty complicated queries. So now I'm going to switch a little bit, but uh, so the other aspect is that, um, you know, in the, I wasn't given that much choice of like, what I could do in terms of the installation. So it's, it's not a, I would say, highly optimized database installation. I mean, um, they said this is what you can have, right? This is the environment you have to work in, you know, you, you install what you ha in that environment, right? So, um, you know, they, in that, when, in our IT shop at that point, they, nobody had installed uh, Linux. So, um, they had installed the first Linux uh, installation in their, in their health IT uh, department. There. So, uh, they had actually, they had vendors who installed it for certain products, but not themselves for an internal project. Um, so, we had to deploy with an existing hospital IT infrastructure, it's a virtualized environment. I know this is not, you know, uh, for a database. Uh, but we're not doing, we're more on the analytics side. It's not a high throughput database. Uh, so, you know, you could provision cores to it. I mean, this is sort of the, it's not anything like, um, you know, sort of groundbreaking. So I'm gonna go through and talk a little bit details on, uh, some of the, I'm gonna fo focus mostly on two and three, 
but I'm going to talk about a little bit about why the schema functionality and the data, you know, where you can sort of have fine grain access into certain databases. The uh, schemas is important. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, discharge data. Also going to talk about uh, spatial data and uh, how we use PostGIS. And then I'm going to give an example of, uh, you know, how we can kind of tie things together in sort of a traditional business intelligence approach to get insight out of the data. So, uh, um, it, you can, I don't know if you, how well you can see the actual name, the database of the schemas, uh, but one of the things that when we started the project, you know, we just wanted a small team, we put everything into the public schema, um, and like we quickly found that, you know, got kind of messy. So I really like that sort of easy to add schemas. We could start organizing our data into sort of separate categories, and we could work within those separate categories. And then also some of the data that we had access to, um, which Sparks data, um, they had different restrictions on it. Some data sets were public. Other data sets were contained uh, what's called PHI, patient level information. Uh, other data sets were limited, but they were licensed or uh, for only certain people. So we need to have uh, control, we need to have different levels of access. I'm not gonna talk, I mean, I learned this stuff basically reading the documentation on the web, how to do it. Um, and it wasn't that complicated sort of to set the access permissions for uh, different users. So one, now I'm gonna, now I'm gonna maybe focus a little bit more on the analytic part and how we solve certain analytic problems. Uh, we had, um, let me step over here. Uh, we have, well, so one of the things in healthcare data is what's called temporal data. We have a lot, of, um, there's a lot of data that's associated with time-based elements to it. Um, trans, uh, and really transition of care is really important. Um, now, um, hospital systems and are basically graded on things like readmission risk, which is the, which I'll, I'll show an example of uh, this. Um, so in, you know, we have, when you're basically in the hospital, it's like in some ways like, like being in prison uh, because you can only be in one hospital at a time, right? So we know that if you're in the hospital, you're in that hospital, you're not getting out, right? You can leave, um, not like a jet prison in that way, but you can always leave. Uh, but you're basically, when you're in that stay at the hospital, um, you, you're basically at that hospital, you can't move, you're, you're associated with that. Uh, and we, you know, when we wanna compute what's called readmission is that, so what happens is if you're in the hospital, um, you know, getting, uh, you're getting treatment, um, you have nurses 24 hours, you have doctors, you have residents kind of, kind of looking over you in very levels, and then, you know, they can, okay, you know, Medicare or Medicaid only pays, you know, three days. Um, now it's time for you to go home, right? They send you home, you know, here's a stack of uh, scripts, you know, you go to your own, you, you go to the pharmacy, you get these filled, and, you know, good luck. And that's really kind of how the, you're, you're somebody else's problem now. You're not the hospital's problem anymore. Um, and what they found is that a lot of people were coming back to the hospital, right? So the transition of care from the inpatient to the outpatient, there were problems. So people were coming back to the hospital. So they have this idea that, okay, if you can get past 30 days of being an in, in outpatient, then probably when you, if you come back to the hospital, it wasn't really related to your original discharge. And so we want to, you know, we want to look at these time intervals and try to compute, okay, is this a readmission to the hospital or not? Um, and so we hope that our data looks um, in nice clean intervals, right? Um, and that's what you cut out of an administrative system. Um, even there it can get a little messy. But if you're, if you're working off electronic health record, the data is not gonna be normalized nicely. You're gonna have, um, you're gonna have sort of intervals of data that overlap, that nest. And if you ever written any as an analyst, you ever written any SQL to process this, it's going to get messy really quick. You get a lot of case statements, um, a lot of endpoint testing. It's 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 uh, messy. Um, so you know the good thing, and this is one of the things that um, why I, I was you know um, I thought I had a safe bet 
using PostgreSQL because there's a lot of support, there's a lot of different functionality that comes like right out of the box. Um, you know, you have a lot of these new, um, say, um, NoSQL database offerings, you know, that don't have all the same level of like the same functionality. And so you end up having to program a lot of stuff that is already built into the database system. And so this is an example where um, there's something already built into the system. So there's a type called range. Um, you can have t date time ranges, date ranges. Um, and so we can represent your stay in the hospital as a range. Um, and so uh, this is an interesting example that you know you were in the hospital, you know, for four days. You're discharged on the 18th day. Um, but you can represent that in two ways as sort of a closed interval. I found, I mean, this is just, I mean, maybe there's better ways, but I found that the there was easier to work with sort of this the the kind of the where you have a a point and then you have sort of just a little bit below that point um, to work with. And so this is how I represented sort of your, your range, uh, your stay within the, within the hospital as a, as a, as a, day, as a range interval. Um, for, the, for the work I was doing, I thought, okay, um, they had um, uh, date range operators, but I said, okay, um, let me actually just convert it to integers. It's easier to work with, easier to understand. And so I convert it to what's called Julian Day, which is a, a way, which is used in claim processing systems uh, for representing dates. Um, and then we could construct a, basically we could, and this is ready actually, I just, you know, search Google, like Julian Day, PostgreSQL, and then, you know, I, the answer came up. Um, and then I figured, you know, then I, we worked out how to like, you know, construct a, uh, a range. And then what's the nice part is you get all these operators. So once you put the, the, your, start span, you know, your start date and your end date into a range, now then you have a whole bunch of operators which you can work with and um, which you can work with. That are, you don't have to write those complicated case statements anymore. You, can, you, know, you can just think in terms of the ranges. And you probably can't see that from here, but uh, there's a whole bunch of different range operators that you can work with. Um, you know, um, pretty powerful. You know, it saves you a lot of, a lot of coding. Um, and so, uh, what we wanted to do is first we want to sort of normalize the data because the data we got was not clean. I used the range operators first to test: is this, you know, do we have intervals that overlap with each other that are adjacent to each other? Uh, and the, you know, I was able to use that quickly, get an answer back to that question, yes, we do. Uh, and so then we had to normalize the data. We had to basically construct those um, inpatient stays based on underlying data. And I'm just highlighting where we use the range operators. Um, and I can show you, so we're basically, question? Um, we used, oh, Charles, well, we used Tableau. We connected the database to Tableau. I've never used Tableau, but I assume it's similar to any tools like Navicat or Access? Um, um, so we used, I mean, so for the, to get the, the sort of like a spreadsheet out, right. we used um, Toad. Okay. So you, I mean, like Navicat is similar to Toad, right, in that okay. they're sort of, It actually, in, in the Toad, um, it actually um, displays correctly. It wasn't a problem. There was some issues when I, which I, with um, the geometry, and it uses a lot, I guess, when Toad brings the geometry data in, it uses a lot of memory, so you have to put a limit in there, because it can cause, like, for some reason, if you don't put a limit in, it can cause the, 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 uh, the sometimes crashes. But that's more a function of Toad, not of the database. No? It, it looks nice. I mean, I could, um, you could, this is how it looks in Toad, right? So it actually represented this nicely. So it's 
looks, you can read it, right? That's always good, right? <laughs> you want to be able to read your data, right? So what I'm doing here is, since you're basically joining, you want to basically, you have to do it in sort of an iterative fashion. You, you join, you, you look at whether there's any overlap for a, for a specific patient, and then you take a union of that, and you update. And you do that iteratively <laughs> until you can't make any more updates to the data. So it's, um, you know, we start off with, um, let me see if I can move this over to, I gotta get over to the side, okay. So like here, this is, these are sort of overlaps or they're not perfect intervals. By applying that SQL repeatedly, we're kind of doing a join, we're seeing, okay, does this intersect? If it does, creating a union, updating, and doing that until we can't make any more changes. So it takes, uh, I just did it sort of, I know you could probably do a more sort of programmatic way, but I just basically, executed until there were no more changes. Um, there's not something we're doing all the time. We kind of process once. Um, and then once you have the data sort of normalized and you have nice intervals, um, it's very easy to say, you know, find me intervals that pair with each other. And then you can basically, once you can find those pairs, then you can find the smallest pair, the smallest difference in pairs to get the one that follows the other one. And so now you basically have two paired um, discharges and you can compute you know, the time difference between the two. And now you have your days to readmission. Um, I think most people, they, they actually take this out, they do it in a, either a SAS or in R or in Python, but this, you know, we could do it within the database. So this is just showing the chain in patient stays. Um, so this is a, I mean, it's a, and basically in, about 70 lines of code. I've no, you know, normalized the uh, date ranges um, and we've linked to inpatient stays so now we can compute readmissions. Uh, I, re I, de I developed this on a test data set, um, but then I applied it to a data set of 100,000 discharges. I don't say, it wasn't like it took hours to run, it was pretty quick to run, I would say in the minutes. Um, so now we have this sort of these intervals of time and now I can pass it on to other analysts who want to build predictive models, uh, predict, predictive risk models, um, and do things like machine learning. But you have to start, you have to have the data in a nice, sort of organized, clean fashion in order for the next people to like build the best, the best possible models. So I'm, now I'm gonna to switch to talking about the, some of the spatial aspects of the, of the uh, so when I was the talk last year, I saw about um, you know the spatial functionality associated with PostGIS. I think there was a, I wasn't here yesterday, but there was a talk, there was a talk on QGIS and also a talk on PostGIS. Um, and um, I had before I had done some work with ArcGIS, so I had some you know basic GIS function like knowledge of just how it works. Um, spatial projection. So it's, it is a very mature, very sophisticated um, system, PostGIS. Um, and this is showing a, you know, the, this data is being served from a PostGIS database. It's showing you sort of doing a spatial projection, um, which these are not trivial things to do. You don't want to write your own spatial projection algorithms if it's, you know, done correctly. Um, so, uh, you know, QGIS is a open source um, GIS system. I've, you know, I've used ArcGIS a little bit, and I, and I feel that you can get most of the same right now, like functionality that ArcGIS has in QGIS. It's, um, and you connect, connect right to the PostGIS database, Postgres database, everything, you know, it's like, it works nicely. It's, you know, it's fast, it's quick, it draws things correctly. So, that's where we can, we can basically do our spatial data processing and then uh, move it, you know, in post, and then have a central repository and all the analysts can work off of that to do sort of spatial analysis. So um, why is spatial analysis so important in this healthcare data setting? Part of it is because, you know, now we're, we have regional health networks. Uh, we want to know where people live, where they are in the network, which providers are they near, so a lot of things become spatial questions, like you know, finding providers, finding hotspots of Medicaid uh, of Medicaid members. 
So it becomes sort of a lot of spatial-based questions. And we can answer those, those, a lot of those spatial-based questions within the database system. So as I said before, Stony Brook is in Suffolk County, New York. Um, so this is Suffolk County, um, you, know, you know, Long Island, right? We're kind of, I guess, right here, right? Um, so Long, Long Island stretches out um, pretty far out into the, you know, um, and it has a, Suffolk County has sort of a, it has agriculture areas where it looks more rural, and you know, most of the portion uh, in the west is more suburban. Um, so one of the things if you've done, if you ask somebody in healthcare data, spatial analysis, right, they say zip codes, postal codes, right, that's the level of, that's the, that's the uh, level that we sort of work with, because the postal codes are there, they're easy to work with, right? Um, and a lot of times the postal codes are good, I mean, but we want to move beyond postal codes if you want to answer more like sophisticated things like the, the distance between uh, you know, a patient and a provider. Um, we could take the midpoint of the, of the uh, zip code, of this postal code region, but that's not always accurate. Some of these postal codes out here in the eastern end of uh, Suffolk County are pretty large. So we want to move to a more spatial based uh, perspective. Um, so now we're going to sort of uh, zoom in uh, we're, as an example to look at why we want to move beyond zip codes uh, to more spatial based healthcare data processing. Um, and just to say that this is, I mean, there are, I think Oracle has spatial extensions. MSQL has spatial extensions, but they're expensive, um, you know, and you, you get really um, mature functionality uh, within PostGIS. And so I'm kind of zooming into one area, and I grew up in Centerport, which is up in this corner here, which is just on the, uh, but I was, from, when I looked at some of the original data, I saw this, um, I always thought that, for example, that there's um, two regions, Dix Hills is one, Honey Station is another one, they're in this 11746 zip code. And I can just maybe if I can get that over, oh, I lost the mask, but um, in this zip code area here, but it's a pretty large area. And since we're interested in the Medicaid population, um, you know, we have this area here in Dix Hills is different, very different socioeconomically than Huntington Station. So if we combine them into one zip code, right, we're gonna miss, uh, we're losing some of the, the granularity that we need to do a kind of a accurate analysis of the population. Um, so um, within that area, right, so Huntington Station and Dix Hills, they have the same zip code, right? Zip codes weren't really developed for population health. They were developed for mail delivery, right? Um, and a lot of them are historical, right? If a community developed a certain point, they, develop, they put a zip code around it. Um, where, you know, so they're not really sort of uh, good units for population health analysis, but that's sometimes all we have to work with. Um, but they're actually, you know, within the Census Bureau, recognizes things other than zip codes. They have census designated places, and they recognize separate communities of Huntington Station, South Huntington, Dix Hills, right? So now I'm gonna show you how these communities are different, right? So, you know, we go to um, Dix Hills, right? Google Street Map. You know, it's, um, I don't know, what's the zoning? Is there three quarter acre to one acre zoning uh, for houses? Um, you know, it's, you know, um, very wealthy area. Um, it's the same zip code as Huntington Station, which is, has more dense housing. Um, and we'll look to see some of the differences between these communities. Um, in order to see some of those differences in the communities, we need to convert our patients' addresses into um, latitude and longitudes. Um, and so we need to use a geocoder for that process. Particularly when we deal with patient addresses, you can't just go to Google and put a patient's address into Google uh, because basically you are telling Google your patient is, they can look at your IP, you're coming from a hospital, and now you're geocoding, you know. So we want to have, we have to do it sort of internally and Google has limits on the number of geocoding you can do. You have to use it within uh, their, their environment. Um, so we need an, uh, another geocoder. Uh, I've used the geocoder within ArcGIS, scripted something for it, 
it's kind of ugly. Um, I found that uh, when you install PostGIS extensions, you can also install a Tiger geocoder. I found some instructions on the web how to operate it, get it working. Um, I installed the street data for New York State because we're only interested in New York State. Um, and this works well for residential addresses because Census Bureau is really interested in people living, residential addresses, they're not interested in businesses. Uh, the one thing I did find with this geocoder is that when it does fail matching an address, it fails pretty badly. Like, um, it, you, know, if it, you have to check on the zip code. You have to add a second level of checking so that you know, you've, if you're, it fails, then you find yourself that it's actually geocoding address in upstate New York, which is, you know, it's outside of the, your zip code. So it's like, this is really bad. Like, that's the best match, really. And so you have to add a second level of checking. I mean, it's great that it's, um, you know, it's freely available. Uh, but you have to add a second level of checking to that. But if you use that extension, uh, there are some no privacy issues with that. Um, and I go through, this is, you know, uh, the, using the geocoder, right? You just put, you can just, and within the SQL, we have a procedure, you can uh, function. You can then call that geocode the address. So I took those two addresses that I showed on Google Maps, geocoded them, you know, so, you know, one is in Huntington Station. The other one is Dix Hills. I'll talk a little bit why these are sort of different communities. Um, you can see that in Census Bureau da uh, data. Um, so we can look at, Census Bureau organizes data in sort of different levels of granularity. Uh, we have things like census tracts, which are a little bit coarser. Uh, we then we have uh, uh, block groups, which is finer grained. Uh, but this is looking at medium household income. Um, and you can see that in the addresses in Huntington Station, right, the medium household income is about uh, $50,000, the lowest there. Um, now, if you go over to Dix Hills, the median household income is one of the areas is 162,000. You know, so th there's a really a big difference in these communities, right? You know, one's a very wealthy community, the other one, you know, um, not as wealthy. And, you know, we will, f my, you know, we find, you know, if you look at the sort of like the map, the data from the state gave us, they color this very, like a bright color. There's a lot of Medicaid members within this region. But those Medicaid members are not living in Dix Hills, they're living in Huntington Station, right? So this is an important uh, sort of conclusion, but if you lose when we just focus at the zip code level. Um, we can also look at the, the ACS has all kinds of data. We can look at the, like, the primary language, right? So up, some of the communities within Huntington Station have you know, up to, I think it's hard to see here, 73% uh, of, of the households, uh, English is not their primary language, Spanish is their primary language in the household, right? So, if you're gonna be mobilizing uh, care managers to uh, patients living within these regions, you wanna make sure they're bilingual, right? Um, because the language barrier is a big issue. So, you know, these are really separate communities and we don't see that when we're at the, the larger green level. Um, I, did, I did also, once you, once you sort of do this and you do it on a, um, you know, within a database system, I can do all of New York State, right? And so you can even see within, this is the Spanish language households, you know, what areas in New York City, uh, you know, have high Spanish, you know, where the households mostly speak Spanish. So how do you get all this nice spatial data into your Postgres database with the PostGIS extension? You start with things called shape files, and they come zipped usually and they have a dbase file format, part of it, and then they have a, some kind of binary format. Um, there's nice tools that are available to basically upload that data, convert that data into a format that can be loaded into your database. And I use, I mean, there's a, there's a GUI uh, tool for it, but there's also command line functionality for that. Uh, how do we load the community survey data in there? Um, you can go to a website called Fact Finder, and get data from there. I, because I was working with a lot of different sort of uh, state, a lot, I was looking at a lot of different variables, I wrote a tool to process some of the ACS data and load it, um, bulk load it into a, into a Postgres database. Um, once the, the ACS data and the shape data is in the database, we can use what's called a GeoID to link the two, right? And now we can, um, we can link those two. And so now we have, now we can um, basically create these maps because 
we can associate the GeoID with the shape. So once you have your data in sort of in spatial geometry, you can be basically you're, you're free from post, postal codes, right? Uh, you can do spatial joins. So if I want to ask a question about towns, school districts, um, uh, water districts, fire districts, I can answer those questions now. I don't have to you know, find a mapping between the zip code and the school districts. And a lot of times those mappings aren't perfect. So I can now do sort of what's called a spatial join, um, doing based on those two addresses. I can see which census tract they're in, which block group they're in. Um, as an example, I'm going to quickly go through this because my time is running out. Other things you can also do spatial processing. So when you load the shape files into the system, these are directly from the census website. If you look at this, this actually doesn't look like Long Island, right? Because it's missing, the shape files overlap areas of water. And when you present your data to, you know, to the higher level people, they say, oh, that doesn't look like Long Island. Um, this doesn't mean, you know, it's like, this looks, so you want to actually, um, the polish of the presentation is important, right? So, but uh, you can within um, all the functionalities within uh, PostGIS, you can do what's called, you can intersect a base land area with the shape files to create nicer looking um, uh, shapes. So you can, you know, these are, we can trim down to the land area so we get a nicer looking map. If you're in the middle of like, for example, in Kansas, it probably doesn't, this is probably not, uh, you probably don't need this, but an area like Long Island and New York where on the coast, the, you know, the, the land areas are important, sort of defining, making it look like actually I'm on Long Island. This is an example of just how to do the um, intersections. There's, you know, um, Post just has a lot, of, a lot of functions for working with spatial data. I can't go into all that, all that detail now, but there's quite a bit. You can, you know, just get on the website, read the documentation, understand it, and do some examples. And it's not, I mean, it wasn't that complicated. Um, and there's just more than um, basic things. I mean, you can do more complicated things. Unions, uh, you can combine shapes together. You can do intersections, which I showed in the other example. You can find mid midpoints if you only have, if you can't geolocate somebody to their address, but you have a zip code, you could use the midpoint uh, as an example of the shape. Um, so there's a lot of different sort of uh, spatial processing you can do within PostGIS. Um, the last uh, thing I'm gonna go quickly through this is um, also working with other tra more traditional types of healthcare data. Sparks is a system of hospital discharges for New York State. Um, what's interesting, the, they like to deliver these files in a very flat format, non-relational format, right? Um, for every single, you have repetitive columns, right? So it makes, what most people do is they write SAS programs to analyze this data that, you know, go through and iterate through the, all the different uh, co columns. Uh, but you want to take advantage of that full relational database model to get more insight from the data. Um, so we didn't have that much time to write a lot of SQL, so we wrote tools to basically normalize the data, do automa automatic normalization of the data, look at it and uh, inspect the database structure, and then build automatic uh, load scripts for that that sort of normalized it. Um, and then what we can do is we can connect to traditional business intelligence tools, um, Tableau, relatively new player in business intelligence, um, but the sort of visualization front end uh, environment. But ultimately what we want to get to is we want to basically get insight. So we're doing all of this to sort of understand our population better, right? So, you know, we're processing the data, we're uh, normalizing, we're looking at spatial relationships. Um, ultimately what we want to do is we want to, you know, get to the people, the managers, the people that run the hospitals, um, a report that, you know, that they can understand insight from. So, this is based, this is from the Sparks data where we've normalized the ICD-9 codes and we looked at secondary diagnosis of Medicaid patients within Suffolk County. And what you can see is they were actually, uh, they, were very, they were actually very surprised that the psychiatric disorders in the, in the population is very high. So, you know, they always look at the primary diagnosis and the, what's called the DRGs, but they weren't looking yet at the psychiatric, you know, the secondary diagnosis of the patients. So these, these uh, Medicaid patients that are coming in, um, you know, have a lot of secondary diagnosis. So this was something we can, through this pipeline, 
be able to give this conclusion out to the higher level, you know, the people that you know wear the ties and the tucked in shirts and the suits, and you know, you know, this is insight for them, right? So we'll be able to get to that point. Um, so parting thoughts, um, health care data for population health is not, let's say, that big. Uh, we're talking, you know, it depends, you know, we can make it big, but we're talking mostly in the millions, 10 million. The biggest database we have has 100 million rows in it. Um, really that spatial aspect for data processing, very powerful tool, um, PostGIS really kind of makes this a very powerful environment for doing healthcare data analytics. Um, one thing, I mean, this is more of a thing, is that the healthcare data analyst, uh, we need to develop sort of a sharing environment. I think that's, we can learn a lot from open source software, share what we do, you know, generate synthetic data sets so that we can, you know, develop algorithms on and, you know, not have to worry about pr uh, private, uh, private, da uh, private data. And the other aspect, I mean, when you look at the roadmap, you know, when you look at the 9.3 to 9.4, Roadmaps, and you look at what was being implemented, and what's being implemented for 9.5, for example, you see that, um, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you look at all some of the extensions, that there's definitely um, good support in the future for, let's say, a more um, data mining um, database. So I think we don't have that much time for questions, right? But. Uh, uh, question? It gives you a. It does. It gives you a rating, right? Beyond what I found is the rating. It's when you get zero, it means like it found the house, right? That location. But then I looked at sometimes the the twenty rating was better than the ten rating. Um, so it, I think it's because it's based on some kind of on a string comparison, and sometimes. Yeah. What I found, trying to restrict it, if it's outside of the zip code, don't trust it, right? So that's a kind of what, uh, I had to build that extra level of sort of check on it. Question? Yeah, I will, I will see if maybe there is a new talk on geocoding with OpenStreetMap okay. and with ArcGIS. So okay. he built a plugin for, or an extension for Photocrest to allow him to use ArcGIS, which he found was more accurate for geocoding. Okay. Yeah. You may, since you may have access to those resources now. Yeah, then we can, especially on the business addresses, I think. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I could, I'll tweet it out, and or I have it, um, I, I can tweet it, I can put it on my Dropbox and t then tweet it out, or g I'll give you the. Uh, There's also a wiki page that you can also put a link, do a link to the okay. slides. Any other, I guess we have the next talk coming. Okay.